I'm going to admit right now that I'm a technologist. That's my background. But I'm also a sociologist. And I recognize that tools are simply tools. And one of the problems that I hear in the technical world is this model of technological determinism where if we think if we use the next great app, the next great product, the next great tool will solve all the problems. And I can guarantee if your strategy is based on a tool set, you have already failed because it's about people, it's not about tools. So let's, um, let's have a look. We haven't got a lot of time, so we can't answer all of the problems of the world. So I'm going to try and take three core principles, that if we look at these three core principles, they'll start to explain what it is we're doing right, what it is we do wrong, and how we can improve things. And just going back to Thibaut's earlier point about the, um, the relationship, we do have a problem in the relationship, and it is about you. It's your fault. I'm the citizen and I don't like what government is doing to me. And that's pretty much the starting point for a lot of the engagement that we have to, to think about. So we're starting a lot of the time from a deficit model. And as much as we want to turn that deficit around, we've got to recognize that it's difficult. So three principles. You don't own the conversation. The, no medium is an island. And what I mean by that is I've taken a little bit of Marshall McLuhan and a little bit of John Donne's metaphysical poetry. And it means that nothing happens in isolation. There isn't just Twitter, there isn't just Facebook. But we'll talk even more about that, and it's about convergence. And I also want to talk about the value in the network and recognizing what the network does for you. So let's just put this in context. This is what the world used to look like. It's really quite simple, it was fairly straightforward. Government used the media to talk to the public. It also did some things itself. There's a little dotted line that every now and again the public got to vote or even demonstrate, and some of it filtered back to government, and they had experts to help them, and most of those experts used to work in government, so they were safe. So, nice, comfortable world. Trouble is, that doesn't exist anymore. The world now starts to look a little bit like this. We still have government, we still have the public, we've still got experts. But we've also got data, and that data comes from government and the public can use it. So the public's much more informed. The media is no longer a one-way process. The media is now bi-directional and user-generated. And of course, underlying all of that, we've got social media as well, which isn't just about having bland conversations and photographs of cats. It's about listening and conversation. And so the relationship between the public and government has now become two-way. The only people that haven't recognized this are governments. So that's the challenge. And of course, experts are no longer just talking to government. Experts are now wheeled out on 24-hour TV to comment on all of this. So they're much more accessible to the public, much more visible. And it comes down to one word, trust. We don't, and we need to. Unfortunately, there isn't a switch. There is a very slow burning fuse that needs to get lit, and it takes a long time. Um, and I feel a little like this at the moment because I'm talking, because we've had to sit on the end here because there's only one keyboard and it's here, and we couldn't work the presentation from the middle. So that means all of you over there, sorry, hello, I, kind of, I can't see you as well. And I almost feel like I'm doing what some consultations do, is I'm talking to one audience here, but I'm ignoring another one over there. But don't worry, I'm not. I'm, I can see you, I can hear you. So it's about trust. How do we build trust? And where are we coming from in this trust model? This is a little pretty picture that I like. And um, within these nice bright colours and some of these boxes are a couple of challenging concepts. One is that government is arrogant and controlling. Not all of it, and government may not think it is, but if you ask the public, that's what they generally think. Government tells us government doesn't listen, it's arrogant and it's controlling. And when it's that, it's top down and it's closed. It issues instructions, it tells people what to do, it makes decisions without proper consultation. Um, living as I do in the UK, I know exactly what that looks like. The government has just introduced a bill into Parliament with one day's notice. And it turns out this bill is hugely controversial. What a surprise. 
and it has regretted it because the public didn't accept that it can do that. So what we're trying to do is move government towards better listening, limited listening, or more flexible engagement, so limited engagement. And ultimately, we're trying to get you to be intimate and co-creative. But these aren't binary states. I don't just want you to say, hey, everything's now co-created, because that's silly, it doesn't work. But what happens is when you're closed and you're arrogant and you think you know best and you only look at yourself for solutions, the range of information that you have and the range of solutions that you have are very narrow. When you're intimate and co-creating and you build partnerships, suddenly the range of options that you have, the sources of information, explodes exponentially. So the further you are along that model, the more options you've got in how you engage. You can still ultimately be arrogant to make a decision. Sometimes you've just got to do that. There is a right time to make a decision. Otherwise, nothing would get done. The key is having the range of tools and the scope to know when that's right and when it's right to engage. So, you don't own the conversation. Make it, share it, get other people to make it for you. Learn from them, listen. Peugeot does this. Peugeot make cars and bicycles and pepper grinders. Who knew they cared about what their customers thought? But they recognize now that buying a car is a conversation. Buying a car isn't just, I like that car. So Peugeot lets you have conversations about what you can do with Peugeot cars and what Peugeot cars can look like in the future. It's an engaging website. It draws you in to build a relationship with Peugeot as a company and a brand that you want to know. This is a government example. Cornwall County Council in the UK has created this website where you can ask questions about how to do things better in your community and the community can crowdsource the answers. So there's a good example of where we can involve community and partners in local decision making, very localised. But at a bigger level, craft huge multinational food company has a collaborative kitchen where you can share ideas for craft products and you can get involved in conversations about what those products are and what they do and what they look like again it's about brand it's interesting we never really use the term brand when we talk about government and that's because it's not very good and we never use the the concept of um, a unique selling point What's the value proposition of my relationship with government? But that's exactly what these commercial brands are doing, and they're using social media and web tools very effectively to do that by not focusing on the tool, but focusing on the conversation and the relationship. So another local government example, Fix My Street. Fix My Street was developed years and years ago by my society in the UK. Now, Fix My Street does two things. It lets you report a pothole or a blocked drain or a damaged road. It also pretty much embarrasses local government into coming up with a solution and doing it themselves. Fix My Street is not an app to fix streets. It's an app to make government realise that it needs to have a relationship with its citizens. It's making them uncomfortable. And as Thibaut said, if you're innovating, you will be uncomfortable. If you're trying to be innovative and you're not scared, you're not innovating enough. So there are lots of versions of Fix My Street around now. This is the Brussels one, where on my mobile phone I can geolocate the pothole or the dead cat that I've just found and I can log it on here. And I thought, well, this isn't fair because, you know, there's, what about other examples? Crime reporting. Okay, crime reporting in New York, I can then map all this data. This is where it becomes really valuable. So why is local government doing this? Yes, of course it is. Local government are now doing these things themselves. I live in Hackney in London. This is Hackney's version of Fix My Street. There's even a typo in the error message. And I didn't do this to embarrass them. I actually started doing this because I was going to use the argument that Fix My Street as an app is just one vehicle in and there should be a common interface where all of this data is shared so we can see the data, council can see the problems, we can see when it's solved, and then I looked at Hackney's and it broke. 
And ironically, I was reporting a dead animal. This is the dead animal. Oh dear. So, no medium is an island. You don't own the conversation, your citizens own the conversation. So where is the conversation happening? And what I want to look at here is how communication is greater than the sum of the parts. TV is not about broadcasting a TV show at 7 p.m. on this channel. It doesn't work that way anymore. TV is a multimedia experience. If you look at any of the big TV shows, it could be Downton Abbey or X Factor. It can be news programs, current affairs, anything like that, sport in particular. Um, there was a soccer match in Brussels last night. How much of that happened on TV and how much of the conversation followed it on Twitter? Where were they? There's, there's a parallel communication stream now. Media doesn't happen in one place. Newspapers are not about print. Successful campaigns grow well beyond their centres. Matthew talked about this morning. My view as, an, as a, an ordinary citizen actually is more likely to influence you than a politician's because we don't trust politicians. They're after something. They're out to win our votes. We don't really feel comfortable with that as, as the public. But when ordinary member of the public, me, says, that's really good, you're more likely to listen. So how do I grow my campaign so I don't have to do all the work and people are doing the work for me? And that's about convergence. Yes, it's about the right tool, but it's getting the timing right and the purpose right. So you've got to understand the messaging, the environment, the whole ecosystem, and select the environment that you're going to work in and focus and target the resources that you've got. Here's an example. This is the Guardian newspaper's website from 1993. Sorry, 2000, 1993 would be good. 2003. There is actually, the first one was, was 1994, I think, remarkably, and it's just not worth showing you. It's so basic. But this, was te this is 10 years old, and this looks like a newspaper. It's got news on it. It's got a different branding. They experimented with this, but this is 10 years ago. So what does it look like now? Quite different. It's branded with the newspaper. It knows who I am. It connects me with all my friends on Facebook who are also very middle class and read the, news, uh, read the Guardian and are all incredibly embarrassed to be caught reading The Guardian. So it connects me with it. It's got advertising on it. It didn't used to have that because there was no money in it. There was, why would you advertise on The Guardian's website? Now there's revenue driven from it. But also, it's a community. It's got jobs. It's got dating. It's got conversation. What you can't see in here is comment, the third item in. If I drill down into comment, that isn't just comments on articles. That's user-generated content. That's you and I writing content to go on the Guardian website. So it's a much more interactive experience than it ever was before. This man is now the Prime Minister of Australia. This was the leadership debate at the very recent Australian federal election. And it had a live Twitter feed where they posted questions on Twitter and on screen, and they took the responses and analysed them off the Twitter stream. So who do you believe? That's a pretty important question when you're watching a leadership debate. And there were two candidates, Kevin Rudd, Tony Abbott. And more people believed Tony Abbott, and he won. Now, that may say nothing, but he was obviously more plausible. But we could see that in real time. We could see voter sentiment in real time, not just from a TV audience sitting in the studio watching the debate, which is the traditional way of doing it, but actually live monitoring and al analysing sentiment on Twitter as that debate occurred. That makes the experience not just immersive, but it makes you part of it. it, makes you more likely to engage. And we've talked a lot this morning about how we engage the disengaged. And part of it is this cross-media strategy of getting the point across to people that there's some value in getting involved. Because most people don't believe there's any value in getting involved. When you look at the research on political engagement, people don't really believe they can make a difference. Now, tweeting a comment about this or responding to a, a poll, a Twitter poll to a live debate, 
may not make a huge difference, but it's a start. And we have to look at these little sparks of, of, of entry into our political engagement. We've got to start very, very light and bring people along. If three people watched that and thought that was interesting or saw something on Twitter and wanted to find out more, then that worked as an engagement tool. You know, how do we scale that up? Well, one of the ways we can scale it up is to get social media and the web much more involved directly in the political process, not just at elections. Politics is not about elections. Politics is about what happens in between elections. That's a really important point. We focus too much on voting and elections, and electoral cycles make politics focus on them. But it's about what happens in the middle. That's where they do the damage. That's where we've got to make sure we're watching. And this is a really good example of using social media to hold a politician to account. This is the Secretary of State for Education in the UK in front of the Educational Select Committee at the House of Commons. They used Twitter with a hashtag, AskGove, because his name is Michael Gove. They asked people to send in a list of questions that they could ask the Minister at the Select Committee. They then not only selected uh, some questions to ask him, and they weren't all serious, there were some funny ones in there as well, but they were all polite, and I don't know how many of the actual questions were polite. Um, although the people that did it say remarkably it was better than they expected. Um, but they then did one other really clever thing. This was all filmed, and the clips were put on YouTube, and the links were tweeted. So they closed the loop. They showed me there was some point in getting involved, and they made it a complete process. This is where I would say the majority of engagement fails, because we do all the work up front, we run the engagement process, and then nothing. Nothing happens, because you're behind the scenes working out what to do with it, or you think you've got it, and that's the end of it. Well, for the public, for me, who took part in that engagement exercise, that isn't the end of it. I want to know what you did with what I gave you. I want to know that you listened to me, that you weighed up what I said, that you valued it, and then that you took a decision. And I can directly see in that decision the information that was given to you by me and people like me. You don't have to do what I ask you to do, but you have to show me that the process is credible is transparent and is authentic. You have to close the loop. And that is the one thing that is so often missing. So what do you do when you're not online? Because not everybody's online. Get a bus. Get radical. Get out of the building. One of the problems with digital engagement is we think it can excuse us from going and talking to people in the real world. Digital is just one channel. If I choose not to be digitally engaged or I have no choice. I can't be digitally engaged. I still want to take part. You've got to deal with me as well. This is one of my favourite examples. It's the National Assembly of Ecuador. And Ecuador has about 30% internet adoption. So that's a big problem when your strategy is largely digital. And the Ecuadorian National Assembly is more digital than any parliament in Europe, with the exception of Estonia. It is way ahead of you guys. Way ahead. Their thinking is just brilliant. And they don't want to leave people behind. So they got a bus, and they put the internet in the bus, and they put parliamentary staff and politicians in the bus, and they take it out to communities that they can't reach otherwise. And it makes it a focal point, so it's a community experience. But it's thinking about convergence. We can use online engagement here, but how do we mix it with offline engagement? How do we do lots of different things and mix it all up a bit? So what we're trying to do there really is say one channel won't work. There are multiple conversations happening in multiple places. You have to manage the resources. The example of the European Parliament with YouTube is a good example. YouTube comments are, are completely worthless. You're wasting your time focusing on those. But you don't want to ignore people who want to comment and go through the YouTube channel. So you need to make sure that they're, they're channeled to somewhere they can comment and that that is effective and does work. Uh, and that, actually, just that process of making them take one step will get rid of the rub a lot of the rubbish because you have to then take a, an effort to do it. So people who really want to comment will click through and go somewhere to do it. And people who just want to leave silly or rude comments won't bother. You can just leave them to it. So actually, that as a strategy is, is quite successful. So 
we've got all of that. You don't own the conversation. Everybody else does. Conversations come from everywhere. The medium is whatever works for on the day, and it works in different places at different times. So what about the network? How do you reach the parts that the other tools can't reach? It's a good Heineken advert, wasn't it? What's the value in the network? Social media is quite powerful, but so is mainstream media. This image doesn't come from Facebook. This image comes from the mainstream media, but it gets a very strong message across. And it's media worthy because it makes the link between what's happening in Egypt, in this case, and the bigger world of social media that's out there. Now, we haven't got enough time today to have the Facebook caused the, re the revolution in Egypt conversation, because it didn't, and it's much more com complicated and nuanced than that. But Facebook did have a lot of, of, of pros in the early days in some of the things that happened in the Middle East. And then it suddenly becomes redundant. And those are good examples of where the right medium works for a time, and you have to move on and change. So here's a good one. Here's my network on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is possibly the most unsexy social network there is. It's really boring. I was reading the LinkedIn's pitch from 10 years ago for venture capital funding recently, and even they struggle to make it sound sexy. And it's just boring. But wow, look at that network. Suddenly that becomes really interesting. All the people in there that I'm connected with, and I can see how they are interconnected, and they change colour, so there's different groups in there, and there are links that go between them. That network is hugely powerful, and each one of us has a network that looks similar to that. might be a little bigger, might be a little smaller, the colours might be different, the weight will be different, who those groups are will be different, but we all have those networks. And suddenly when we visualise it, we see how powerful network communications can be. So what you need is a mobile phone and a network, and you can communicate to the world. This is the Iranian elections. This is where I live in Hackney. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Tehran or the east end of London. You can use a mobile phone and your network to get a message out very quickly. And the thing is, it's not the value of your network that counts, it's the value of your network's network and their network, because this is a multiplier effect. So the European Parliament is a great example. They have about 850, got a little picture, 875,000 likes when I took this screen grab a few weeks ago. It's probably 900,000 by now. That's not the number that matters. The number that matters is the network beyond that. If you go three layers deep, that's probably 80 million people. It's huge. Now, the European Parliament is not going to be able to communicate with 80 million people directly, but if you do it for them, if you retweet or repost something that they say, and you're a person with a powerful network, they're doing the job for you. So a key part of the strategy is knowing how to use your network to get the information out, to reach the people you can't reach. If we're talking about engaging the disengaged, no one disengaged is going to follow the European Parliament on Twitter or like it on Facebook. But their friend's friend might, and things might get shared. So there are ways through. We don't have to do this directly. We can get our networks to do it for us. And that's really powerful. This has no great educational benefit other than I love it. This is a, another example of a parliament using Facebook. And this is the Chamber of Deputies in Paraguay. Paraguay is not the first country that springs to mind when you ask about sophisticated digital parliaments or sophisticated digital societies for that mind. Nothing wrong with Paraguay, but it's small. It's in an interesting position. It has some economic issues, has some political issues. It has 6,000 people liking it on Facebook. That's quite impressive. So you can, even when you're small and you don't have a big internet society and you don't have a big um, culture of getting involved in democracy and you're an emerging democracy, Paraguay is an emerging democracy, 
you can still use these social tools to build presence and capacity as a channel. And this is an even better example of what you can do with the wisdom of crowds. Um, we have a problem in some parts of northern Europe called ash dieback, which is a disease that ash trees get, and there is no cure for it. When ash trees get it, they die. It's gone right through Denmark, I think parts of northern Europe, and we now have it in the UK. And it will kill 90% of ash trees in the UK if nobody does anything about it. And ash trees are very prominent in the UK. So how do you find a cure to it? Well, the traditional way is you do scientific experiments and you do lots of these things in labs and you maybe take samples of trees. Alternatively, you could use Facebook. So how do you find a cure for a disease using Facebook? It's really interesting. This pattern here is a genetic code for an ash tree. And the disease shows up where the codes don't match. So they created a game that you play on Facebook and you have to line up patterns and make patterns match. It's quite difficult. I tried it. I couldn't do very well at all. But every time you find the right sequence that doesn't match, you provide a solution to the ash dieback problem because you've just logged a genetic code that will help cure the disease. Computers can't do that. Computers don't get this kind of pattern recognition. They're really stupid at it. You can't do this in a lab because there's nothing to put in the lab. You can understand the, the genetic code. You can see the difference, but you can't see where the differences are in the way that we can as people. It turns out, one thing, if there's one thing humans are really good at, it's pattern recognition and pattern matching. We're great at it. We're way better than computers. So if you create a game where you get the public to play this and match patterns, they're curing this disease. It's incredible. And very radical. So, what does it mean? What's democracy got to do with trees? Okay, so I started here. You're arrogant, you need to be friendly and intimate and co-creating. You need to get warm and hug people, digitally, of course. And if you do, that gives you options. It gives you much more options by just saying, we'll sometimes go out and ask people. The more you do it, the further you move along this spectrum, the more options you've got and the more you can do. So how do you move towards intimacy? You go where the people are. That's really quite obvious. But it's amazing how unobvious the obvious is sometimes. Um, you listen. You listen a lot and then you listen some more. I often get asked by politicians, What's the, what should I do to be good at social media? What they mean is, what should I do to get re-elected? But what they ask is, what should I do to, to be good at social media? And I say, well, the first thing you should do is nothing. Don't tweet. Don't create a Facebook page. Don't blog. Listen. Find out what people are saying. It's amazing what you can pick up if you listen properly. And to listen properly, you need to be silent. That's really hard for politicians to do, by the way. It's so counterintuitive. I love their reaction to it. And be authentic. Be real. Be human. Uh, it's really hard for institutions to be human. And I know a lot of um, political and parliamentary and government institutions have really struggled using social media because how do you create a voice that both has the gravitas of the organization but is engaging and human? And the answer to that is it's really hard. And you have to try and experiment, and sometimes you'll go wrong. The European Parliament's done really well with Facebook. It's just a little bit casual, but it's not too casual. Um, a lot of people just broadcast. Don't broadcast. Have a conversation. And if you broadcast third-person statements, go home now. Give up. Because I don't want to see them. Nobody wants to see them. They've got to be first-person. They've got to be human. And share. Sharing is great. Now, is it better to give or to receive? Actually, it's better to share. Share it all around. You share things people tell you, get them to share what you tell them. Build a relationship. Build a conversation. Join in. Where the conversation's happening, join in. Take part in it. Don't make the conversation come to you. Get off the walls of your big castle, your fortress of parliament or government department. 
go to the community where the conversation is. If you're talking about finance, go to the finance blogs. If you're talking about kids, go to where the kids are. If you're talking about bullying, go to the blogs about uh, and the websites that are supporting teenagers being bullied. As adults, we don't understand those problems as much as we'd like to. Go to where they are, have a conversation, join in. And as I said before, close the loop. So if you, say, if you ask people something, give them something back. Show them that you, you value their contribution and their time and give them something back. And this is really difficult. Trust your staff. Trust the people that work for you to do this and own the mistakes. Because guess what? You will make mistakes. I have yet to see a tweet be fatal. They're not that scary. We all send tweets out when, and go, oh my God, we shouldn't have done that. By the way, there is a, a Twitter account in the UK called MPs Deleted Tweets. <laughs> so if you do make a mess of it, don't delete it because actually that makes it worse. Unless it's defamatory or legally you have to delete it, it's best to just admit it and carry on. We're human. Actually, sometimes when you make a mistake, people will suddenly go, wow, they are human. We never knew. So trust people to, to you can't go through massive sign-offs with this stuff. You've just got to do it. You know, I, I wrote the social media guidelines for World Parliaments, and my first reaction was, oh, God, do you need this? And they kind of do because they're risk-averse organisations, so they need a bit of help to do it. But if this is something you're going to check every time you tweet, you've got it wrong. You've just got to do it. You've just got to go for it. You know, life's too short to sit around reading manuals and procedures sometimes. It's like the Wi-Fi code this morning. How many people had to queue to get a piece of paper they had to sign to get a Wi-Fi code? Think about it. It's a metaphor for a lot of the problems that we have. Okay, so business as usual. What does digital do? It's a, you know, let's support the effective use of the tools that we've got by having clear policies and light rules. Don't over-regulate, but be clear about what people can and can't do. Good just-in-time training. If you need to know it, find out how to do it. Don't go on courses a year ahead and figure out how to use Twitter. It's pointless. Just learn it on the fly. Because by the time you've done the course, the thing has changed. Trust people. Make mistakes. They're rarely fatal. And get people to be your best advocates. That's the real win with social media. Get people to support you and retweet and repost and acknowledge what you do as good and draw other people in. And connect them to your brand. Governments do have brands. They're just really badly perceived. But if we recognise that government is a brand, we can start to see how we turn that around. Until you admit it, you can't. Reshare things people give you. And above all, just innovate. Innovate, innovate, innovate. Make mistakes, lots of mistakes, small ones, quick ones. Fail, learn, fail again, learn some more, carry on and do it. And do it with key goals in mind. Know where you're trying to get to. I don't quite agree with that Seth Godin quote before. I think there is a map. It just isn't what we think of as a map. And actually, it's not a compass. It's a, it's a sat-nav. I, I love maps because they give me the big picture. I hate sat-navs because three seconds before the junction, it tells me to turn right, and I'm in the wrong lane. I need a bit more information than that. So don't dismiss maps completely. Just remember it might be a different kind of map that we're looking for. Thank you.